All right, so let's take a look at a Eureka Math uh, quick start guide. So this is like a quick overview. Um, please, this is not meant to be a substitute for professional learning with this program. What I'm gonna talk about is um, far less than, than what there actually is in the program. You can spend days talking about this program. Uh, but this is more geared towards teachers that were out of the game for a little bit, or you're like hired today and teaching tomorrow and you need to get going. Uh, so I pulled a lesson here. This is a lesson three from grade two, module five. and this is a fairly typical lesson. A lot of lessons are structured fairly similarly. So, you know, there are, you will see some changes in different lessons, but generally speaking, this is how they're set up. Um, I'm gonna go through this the way that I typically, uh, whenever I teach or I advise teachers, uh, this is how that I, I would do it, all right? Um, this application problem, which sometimes you'll see comes after the fluency, um, is a great way to start the day. So a lot of times teachers will take this problem, all right, which is a word problem or a story problem, and they will use it in the morning for morning work, all right? And then when they come to class, uh, kids are ready to go and you're ready to discuss it. One of the things uh, you don't wanna do when you do your application problem is you don't wanna turn it into a teachable moment. And this is where you can get trapped. Uh, you know, this is built for 60 minutes here, this lesson. And sometimes you'll get caught spending 15 minutes on just the application problem. So just know that the application problem is a review typically of the day before, all right? It's not a teachable moment. Give your kids some time to work on it, then go over the answers, uh, bada bing, bada boom, you're out, all right? Um, another thing you could do is if you're gonna have them do morning work, uh, you can take, so here's your the question, a children's library sold 27 donated books and now they have 48. You can, if you want to in the morning, just remove the question of this uh, story and just give them the first part. And uh, it's something called the read, draw, write uh, protocol maybe have them focusing on the reading and the drawing uh, and just know that with the reading also comes understanding. Do they understand what's going on? Have them do the reading and the drawing in the morning. And then when you get to your math block, that's when you introduce the question. Um, it might be a lot for kids when they walk in the door in the morning to jump right into a word problem. Uh, it might be just a lot for them to, to handle. So just maybe just do the first part of that. Okay. All right. Moving on, the fluency. Here there's only two fluency pieces. A lot of times there's three, and my advice to teachers is that if there's three, I usually tell them to remove one. And you know, it's kind of like with a grain of salt. Don't just pick one all willy-nilly to remove. You have to understand the program and know where it's going. So if a teacher constantly removed the uh, happy counting, that would be a bad piece to remove because it comes up frequently uh, counting up and counting down are skills that leads to lead towards addition and subtraction and you wouldn't want to remove that from the fluency piece okay but you might find that you know if i try and do all three of them now once again there's only two here i'm not going to have enough time in this lesson or it's going to be overwhelming um, so tr if you can remove one of them um, but just know that while you're removing it while you're removing it if a principal said that, hey i saw you only did two out of the three here make sure you could say oh yeah i removed that one because my kids are already secure in that skill or i was able to incorporate that uh later in the day something like that um, two pieces of fluency that i'm going to talk about uh, in particular are the the happy counting which you know that goes into skip counting um, you don't have to do these math pieces in your math block all right when you do the happy counting, counting up and counting down, you can do that almost at any time during the day. If your kids need a break or when they're lining up, you can fold those pieces throughout your day, scatter them. You can do it as part of your morning work. Um, the other piece is here, there is a sprint, all right? And these sprints are kind of like those math dashes or mad minutes, whatever you wanna call them. When you do a sprint, you have to emphasize the focus is on growth with your students, okay? And when you get to a sprint, all right, and I can scroll down to this sprint here, um, you might find that, um, here it is, you know what, my students aren't ready for this, or some of them aren't ready for it. If your students aren't ready to do this sprint, which is, which is designed for them to work on their fluency, like speed and accuracy, if they're not ready for this sprint, you should not administer, administer it to the kids. Okay, likewise, you wouldn't have your entire class reading a book on the same level. You wouldn't do the same thing with your fluency pieces, uh, especially your sprint here. Uh, so you might have kids doing different sprints in your class, and you can see how that might be a, a station um, it, when kids are working in groups or something like that, okay? So make sure kids can tackle these patterns uh, or strategies, and if they can't, then it's probably not appropriate for them uh, when you go to do that sprint, all right? Uh, the next part, you're gonna get into your concept development. All right. And, you know, as we go through these timings, you know, I'm, I, I talked about how like, hey, try and be faster with your application problem. Remove some of the fluency. 
we're trying to steal some minutes from these two pieces so we can fold them maybe a little bit more into the concept development. All right, that'll allow us to pull small groups to talk about, you know, maybe the kids that didn't do so well on the exit ticket the day before. All right, but when you get to the concept development, I, I like to think of this as the meat and potatoes of the lesson. Typically, you know, there's like three problems in the concept development and they scaffold. Now this one has four, so whatever. Um, but they're scaffold. So they go from uh, easy, more uh, concrete and representational uh, to harder, which would be more abstract. And as you go through these, hopefully a lot of your kids can get in the first problem and make understanding. And what you'll find is when you get to problem number two, maybe the majority of your kids, but you maybe lost one or two, all right? When you get to problem number three, maybe only half your class is now following along here because the problem's getting harder and harder. And when you get to problem number four, you know, you're only really teaching the four or five kids in your class. You have to make a choice when you're doing your concept development. What problems am I gonna show to my students? I would highly recommend not showing all of them, okay? It doesn't really make sense to teach an entire class of 20 kids this problem here, problem number four, if only three of them are getting it, all right? And on the flip side of that, if, if you're only teaching to three kids how to do this problem, don't show them, they'll figure it out. Let them struggle with it. Um, I, I always say that I think every kid deserves a productive struggle and don't take that away from them. If this is gonna cause those kids, those three or four kids to struggle, then let it happen because those kids need to struggle. So maybe when you're looking at your concept development, you're like, you know what? I'm only gonna do problems number one and problem number two. I'm gonna pull a small group and that group I'll show number three and I'll let, uh, I'll let to see if those other, those other kids can figure out number four, all right? Remember, when you're doing your concept development, you're trying to you know, get a little bit more time here. So now you maybe have 40 minutes to work here. Uh, this is when you start to pull small groups and things like that, okay? So be selective in the problems you give, but also know why you were selective, all right? Another thing that I think this is very intimidating to look at if you're new to the program, this teacher, student, teacher, student, these are just simply a guide. Like, hey, if you're not sure what to say as a teacher, here's something you could say, and this is probably what you can expect the students to say. When I go into lesson planning, what I'll typically do is I'll write two or three questions on the side that I wanna ask, uh, ask the students, and you'll find that the more you do that, the better you'll get at doing this on the fly. So come November, December, you can start doing that um, without having to write it down. Right. After the concept development, this leads into the problem set and this is where kids are going to work. Um, oh, there was a fifth problem there, by the way. Uh, then the problem set, this is where the kids are going to work for, it says 10 minutes, okay? Uh, that is a work for duration, not work for completion. So you're gonna set, you don't have to set a timer, but just know that, okay, maybe you have a little bit more than 10 minutes because you saved some minutes from the other pieces there above. Um, kids are gonna work for 10 minutes, 12 minutes, whatever the case may be. Uh, the thing is, because they're not working to complete all of these problems, and you can see them on the, the right-hand side here, you need to be very selective as to the problems they work on, all right? So I recommend setting up a must-do and a can-do. So let's jump into this problem set here. Uh, there's our sprint. Here's our problem set. We have this problem here, and then we have these over here, problem number two. And then here's problem number three, okay? Um, I always recommend jumping into the exit ticket first and look at the exit ticket. Uh, the exit ticket is aligned to what we would consider proficient for this lesson. So by the end of this lesson, uh, the kids need to know how to do um, problems similar to these one and two. So when I jump back into the concept development, I can see that those problems are very similar to uh, maybe C and D or something like that. So when I'm telling kids which problems to work on, I might set up some must-dos and some can-dos. So must-do problems might be something like, every kid needs to do problem one, A, C, and D, two, A, and B, and then the can-dos are maybe, you know, some of these rest, some of the rest of these, and then also number three. All right, you can see how number three is definitely progressively uh, a little bit harder or more abstract than the problems above it. All right, so set up must-dos and can-dos, but make sure you always align must-dos with the exit ticket because that is the level of proficiency we want kids to be at for this lesson. All right, it's what we would consider a success in this lesson. All right, all right so now our kids are working maybe in groups and pairs or independently through their problem set. All right, when that 10 minutes is up, you're going to jump into your debrief. This is where you're going to restate your lesson objective and maybe, maybe some success criteria 
if you establish them. All right, this is what it looks like to be successful. And this is where you can also ask some questions. Uh, and the program does give a good, a good list of example questions that you can ask. Right? After the debrief, this is where kids jump into the exit ticket. I have yet to see kids finish the exit ticket in three minutes. So know that this is gonna take a little bit longer for them to finish. All right, might take five or six minutes. Um, and if kids finish early, then you know, put them on Zern or, or something like that. Um, when the kids turn in the exit ticket, grading them. Try to avoid nickeling, diming points on the exit ticket. All right. I typically tell teachers, put them into four buckets or four bins. A four is, yes, you, you, you nailed it. You knocked it out of the park. Every component was there that you needed. Um, I'll show you this exit ticket down here. A three is going to be, you know what? You had some minor mistakes, but they didn't really take away. I, I can still get that you understood what was going on. So that's a three. A two is, you know, I'm going to pull you for a small group tomorrow. And with a little bit of remediation, I can get you up to a three. And then a one is basically not a two. Okay, so you put kids in the, the their exit tickets into these four buckets. Four is yes, three is all right, you're where you need to be. Two is just a little bit of help, and one is oh my gosh, a lot of help. Um, and that's how you can score them and keep track. It's a much easier system than trying to trying to nickel and dime and mark up the papers like crazy. All right. Now, uh, when you get to the homework, you'll see that the homework. All right, we looked at the problem set before. You'll see that the homework is pretty closely aligned to the problem set. So any problems that you gave to kids, this is if you give homework, by the way, any problems that you gave to the kids during the problem set and they were successful on, you'd give the same ones to them in the homework, okay? If you didn't, if you told kids that, hey, you didn't get to need to get to number three, then don't assign that for homework. Homework is meant for practice and you don't want kids practicing things they don't know. Um, that being said, you might also say, you know what? I'm gonna save this homework to like two, two or three days from now, and then I'm gonna give it to them because then I can know they can do the whole thing. Um, but just know that when you send something home as homework, if it's meant to be practiced, kids need to know how to do everything on that page. And if they don't, it's not appropriate to be sending home. All right. Um, some other things, so just some little nuances. I know in first grade, they really start doing sprints um, early. Uh, there's a front and a back to the sprints. When you, if your kids aren't ready to do the front and the back of a sprint, then don't do the front and the back of the sprint. Maybe only do the front. All right. You really have to think of this lesson planning as kind of like a chef in your kitchen, right? You have different ingredients that you're pulling from the fridge uh, to kind of make this dish that's appropriate for your class. Okay. Um, you don't want to add too many spices if your kids, if your kids aren't ready for spicy food. All right. Um, so just know that this isn't a structure in which you need to follow uh, as if you're baking bread, okay? This is a structure that says, hey, here's a lot of pieces we're going to give to you, and I really want you to be selective uh, and intentional about what you're doing and why you're doing it, okay? So if you feel like three fluency pieces is too much, then only do two of them, all right? Um, with the concept of development, if you're only going to do two of the problems, that's fine, but just make sure you know why you're only doing two of them, all right? Uh, the more you do this, the better you'll get at it. And um, I think like just another piece of advice, I would say uh, there's a lot of resources out there to help you with this. Uh, but I found that if I was taking someone else's Google slides and trying to make them my own, I was spending so much time trying to reformat uh, people's materials that they designed for themselves. Um, my, my push to you is if you have the time, develop your own materials. And in doing so, you will understand the program so much better. Uh, and you might actually save yourself time because you're not undoing a lot of other people's work or you're not fiddling through their slides and then coming back to the lesson plan and reading it. Um, if you develop your own work as you read through the lessons, you'll have a much better understanding of the program um, and you'll feel much more confident teaching it. Uh, and the kids recognize that, all right? All right best of luck and let me know if you need anything.